Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Going to Bat with Team Irie. This is episode number 34. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, you can scroll down the Facebook page here and watch those. If you're interested in some of the upcoming videos, the interviews, you can keep an eye on the foundation page here. We usually post them the day up or the day before the interview. And if you're interested in some of the events that we do in public to raise money for the foundation, or if you'd like to uh, donate money to the foundation, you can go to our website, which is dif35.org. We appreciate any help you could give us. And tonight's guest is Ed Hearn on the 1986 New York Mets World Series Championship team. How you doing tonight, Ed? Good, man. I haven't changed a lick, have I, David? No, you I'm, look the same. You really look the same. I haven't aged one bit, man. I tell you what, that's what happens when you're World Series champion. You just you just stay good looking. Oh, you geez, do, man. Oh, good, my goodness. <laughs> oh, the truth's out now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You you're looking good there, though. So I can't. Yeah, well, uh, you know, you try to trick them, but you know what the heck? Truth comes out eventually. Exactly. Hey, well, ha ha happy birthday, my friend. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, you know, my birthday present was, ha was having you on here. Oh, well, geez, man. You, 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 you took, I don't know what to say now, man. That was, I appreciate that, man. I, yeah. I, I, I told you earlier today, I said, I'm very honored to be your guest on your birthday. It's very special. And it's special to me to have somebody that uh, has gone through everything that you've gone through and done what you've done and of course, we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, you know, I really wanted to have you on here tonight, and especially on my birthday, because, you know, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy listening to you and, and hearing your story. Uh, but we'll start out a little bit about and talk about your, you know, your minor leagues. Uh, you know, a lot of people, which I've had on here, was talking about the struggles getting through minor leagues. And, and I know a lot of them, it usually takes them four years to, to get to the uh, major league and, and all that. But You've done something really special when you were in the minor minor leagues and and when you made it to the major leagues those four consecutive years. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, you know, Dave, I was drafted out of high school in 1978, and uh, it was I was drafted in fourth round, and I had football opportunities at, at some big schools. Uh, I had a point to West Point Military Academy, some Ivy League schools for football. Um, but, and, and really my dream was to be an NFL quarterback, quite frankly, but, um, because of the, uh, the type of system that I played football in at high school, I was at, it just wasn't going to develop me because I was more of a drop back pro style quarterback. And, and we had trouble doing th anything besides running right, run left, and then they'd get us, get us first down on oh, third down. But, um, I thought it was a hard decision what I want to do, but I signed with Phillies. And uh, the first year, I, I went, um, oh, a couple thousand miles away from the East Coast of Florida, where I grew up, to Helena, Montana. And they had, uh, it was the first year that they had a pro team in the Pioneer League. And it was the, the Phillies, obviously, rookie team. And so the people there thought we were gods. <laughs> I mean to tell you, uh, but... It was a real special year. It might have been one of my very favorite years in all of baseball, including the big leagues. Um, you know, I was roommate with, with Ryan Sandberg, all future Hall of Famer, and we had five or six guys on that rookie league team that made it to the big leagues. Um, and, and that's a very high number for, for a rookie league club to produce that many big leaguers. I remember our, our manager, uh, uh, Larry Rojas, and he sat us down there early in early mid June after the draft, and we sitting around. And he he, he talked in broken Spanish. And he said, "Choo choo choo, could you guys look around here? You see all you choo choo guys? Which one you gonna make the big league? One, maybe two, make the big league. Who who is gonna be? Well, we fooled him. <laughs> Five or six of us made it. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. So it was a good time, and uh, you know." I had a I had some major injuries right after that minor league that first year in Helena, which I missed a year and a half of ball and came back. And uh, one of the injuries was a torn ankle, and it was so bad that the Phillies team doctor that put it back together told the Phillies that that they didn't he they he did not think that, the, that I would catch again. I might not even walk normal again. So the Phillies uh, used me basically as an organizational guy over the next several years because I could hit. And, you know, I DH played first, but 
they didn't, they didn't even never let, let me get back out and play and give it a try. So finally, after uh, oh, five, six years in the minor league, you talk about four, got four years. I'd love to gotten there to the big leagues in four years. But I was five, six years the Phillies, and finally I said, look, let's be men about this. You know, I know you're using my offense to, to help some of your teams win a little bit better, but, you know, I got other things in life to do. I got some smarts here, and ba- it's not baseball or nothing, Fred Hearn. And just, I'd like to, I wish you'd give my release, and let's just move on. And if I, if another team will give me the opportunity to try to catch, I, I'll, I make, I want to play. I, and if I can't catch, I will never play the big leagues as a first base in DH because I'm not going to get 40 home runs unless I get Martin McGuire steroids or something. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> so, so the, the Mets organization, uh, they, they called me and they were willing to give me a chance to catch every other day, at least have split time. And I had to go back to a ball in Lynch Curve, Virginia, where I'd played the two previous years before I was MVP, two all-star teams. And here I'm going back to a ball. And you know, it's like, well, that ain't very much fun, but, um, it started a run with the Mets that a year mentioned earlier there and leading in this conversation where I, I went um, in Lynchburg in 1983. That was the year Dwight Gooden, uh-huh. you know, just ex- came on the scene, exploded. Lenny Dyke crystal over over hundred bases in a minor league season. Uh, Dwight Gooden struck out over 300 in a minor league season. And uh, it, we, we were just loaded. We were loaded. We won over hundred games in 140 game schedule. So the Lynchburg Mets, and so we won uh, the league championship That's in pretty. 1983. So that was pretty cool. It was a lot of fun. Now, I've yeah. been six years. I was 22 or three at that point because I signed when I was 17 at high school. Next year, I moved up to double A, and uh, darn if we didn't do it again. <laughs> Jackson Mets, double A. Yeah. There's, there's championship ring right there. Following year, 1985, I got moved up to um, – Triple A, Norfolk, Virginia, with the Tide Water Ties. And don't you know? Well, you won again. Yeah. So the Mets, you know, I, you know, you think, I mean, what are the chances of that happening? And I never thought about it back then. But once I got to the big leagues and we won the World Series the following year in my rookie season, I had people later on, like from Sabre, you know, the statistical baseball research people that, you know, I mean, they know how many – I mean, they know everything. I, I can't. They blow my mind. And one time, one of them came to me and said, you know what? You may be the only person in history of baseball to win four consecutive championships, one at each level of professional baseball in consecutive years with the same organization. And I said, well, how in the heck do you even think about that? <laughs> but, but you know, uh, it, it's kind of, kind of turned into a funny thing. And people introduce me like, oh, this guy did four years of this, that. And I, and I tell them. Like I told you earlier, yep, and the Mets traded me away to Kansas City next year, and they ain't won a World Series since. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep, exactly, the curse of Ed Hearn. There uh, you go. <laughs> and, uh, you know, are you still the only person in history to ever win four consecutive championships like that? I don't know if I am, was ever. I mean, that's crazy, but, you know, these people that do this research, I can't, I mean, I guess it's not wouldn't be that hard. I mean, how many World Series has there ever been? Then you'd have to backtrack on each of those guys to see if they won in AAA, and and you can eliminate most of them, bro. And so I don't know. People keep saying that about me, and I keep going, yeah, okay, well, I'm lucky. Then the Mets were unlucky when they traded me. <laughs> hey, that that's. Oh, I see. And you know, I did I didn't give I didn't give them. I was gonna save it, but 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 that's that's the big one you play for right there. Oh that's, yeah, that's, that's the World Series ring right there. Yep, I have, cool. I, I have trouble with these cameras there, David. Yeah, I'm kind of there. We go. That's there you go. Better. That's getting better. Yeah. So I have four rings, one each year in Pro Bowl. Then I got traded, and and, and you'll want to know about the rest of that story. But uh, yeah, there's uh, the big trophy. There's the trophy. That's the players' model of the World Series trophy, sitting there. And uh, so I brought yeah. that along just to. Show show your show all your followers. And, yeah, because it ain't every day you get to get to see one of those. No, that's beautiful. Uh, you know, we talked about you know you roomed with Ryan Sandberg. What kind of guy was Ryan Sandberg? Ryan was a good guy. I I liked Ryan a lot. He was very quiet. Uh, he went and did his job. You know, when when we had like a little spring training after the draft, and they 
signing guys and free agents after that. And um, uh, I remember early on there in that spring training, one thing I remember, I was the only catcher in camp. Oh, boy, I was just worn out. And, you know, they draft these pitchers that can throw 150 miles an hour, and they don't know where it's going. And so I was just getting beat up that first 10 days. Well, but there was a guy there at shortstop named Julio Franco. And he looked like he was going to be our shortstop. Well, Julio played for like 122 years, I think, and he could hit and all that. But, but you know, about two weeks into our camp, just before our season started, you only play, um, I think, 70, 60, 70 or 80 games in, in half-season rookie ball. But just before we started, this guy came in, and he started taking ground balls to shortstop. We're like, who's this cat? And you see Julio – was a fan, you know, he was fancy and, you know, he jumped and drove in the hole. He had all that style stuff. This guy, you know, he came in there and just feel that ball smooth and he threw every runner out by just like that. Like he wasn't even kind, just his name was Ryan Sandberg. And Julio Franco got shipped out to a co op team to make room for Ryan Sandberg. Wow. And, uh, you know, most guys, they always remember getting that call to the majors. You went up, you know, one in consecutive years, but what was it like when you got that call that you were going to come to the majors? Uh, it, it's so real. I don't, I don't really have a good story about it. Um, but my manager in AAA that year was Sam Perlazzo. No, it wasn't. No, it was Bob Schaefer. See, that's how bad it was. It was so surreal. And I have a story for everything. I mean, I travel the country doing speaking and all, and it's a crazy life journey. But, you know, that that one thing that was just so real, it was like walking out in the Major League Field the first time there at Shea Stadium. It was just like, oh, look at this grass. It smells so sweet. And, you know, the hot dogs are starting to cook. And, oh, man, I just wanted to take a nine iron and hit some balls off that turf, boy. That was it was like big league stuff. You know, after you played eight and a half years in the minor leagues like I did, uh, it, it, it's a beautiful thing. But I, I got called up out of Paul Tuckett, Rhode Island. We were playing the Red Sox AAA team. And uh, it was it was, it was was uh, after the game, we had gone back to the motel and showered and we were sitting around eating or whatever and got a phone call. And Skipper said, hey, man, you're going to the show. And, and you know, it, just, it was just – it was like I blanked out. Yeah, that – I, I could imagine. Like, until I got there. And then, then we went on a road trip and I played my first game in uh, Dodger Stadium, uh, NBC Game of the Week, Joe Garish Yola and uh, Vince Scully. I mean, you can't get any better than that call in your first big league game. And um, I, they, there was something, the first game went overtime. Or, and so they missed my first at bat, which was a single to write off by Welsh. Well, but I, they were there on national tv for my second at bat and, and uh, it, it you you may have seen it on video on one of my videos i'll have it on my introduction stuff uh, uh ben scully is saying here comes ed hearn he's a young man drafted by the phillies in fourth round he had an appointment to the west point military academy at six foot three 220 pounds he would have made an impressive looking general yeah. and correct i popped that ball it was like it was edited you know, and then he was kind of just fill in the background. Boom! I dropped it, dropped the ground a little double left center. <laughs> so that yeah. was big. That was big thrill, and uh, uh, some fun things happened that game. We could go on all night about stories of things. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. It's just it's just so exciting. Uh, uh, anybody tells you they ain't, they ain't pooping in their pants their first big league game is just bad liars. All these politicians we got today. Exactly. I agree with you there now. Yeah. All right. I, I can't get started on that subject now. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the 86 season, which of course we all know how it ended. And we'll talk about that a little bit, but there's a little bit of drama going up to the 86 season in Houston and also in Cincinnati when they had to put Gary Carter on third base because of an incident. Now the Cincinnati incident, which I live close to Cincinnati. I'm a big Reds fan. Could so you? Much. So was I. Could you talk a little bit about the Cincinnati incident? Yeah, well, Eric Davis slid in third base and, you know, um, and a little push and shove between him and Ray Knight. Next thing you know, Ray Knight just popped him right in the nose, man. And, boy, we emptied. It was all empty and it was it was all on. Now, you don't mess with Ray. Ray was a gold glove boxer. 
and he had quick hands and you know eric's a great athlete and tough dude himself but that was a big brawl and they got kicked out of the game so then when you we'd have the, we didn't have anybody else at the time to play third so gary moved to third and i went went into catch and it was just it's just a different game you know just i mean we had a lot of fights that year uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't understand why, because we were such angels. We were such nice fellas. Yeah, I guess because you didn't play for the California Angels, or you wouldn't yeah. have. But the match, I remember that game. I remember that fight between Ray Knight and Eric Davis. So, I, you know, I remember that incident. Well, it sure wasn't the only one. Because yeah. we, we, we were not liked. Uh, because, you know, there was a book written about us, um, Jeff Perlman wrote a really nice book uh, that, that I can't believe guys really shared a lot of the truth about what went on that team. I mean, I remember Sports Illustrated article, it's quote, George Brett quoted it in the forward to my book. It went something like the um, 1986 Mets were a portable party driven by alcohol and amphetamines. And, you know, well, they left off a whole bunch of other stuff too, unfortunately. I mean, but it was called Bad Guys One, and and we it was a bad team. It was it was a throwback team to those back in the early you know Yankee days with with uh, all them guys running out and partying and all this stuff. And uh, when we came to the park, uh, Davey Johnson said, "Spring train, uh, we're gonna win this thing this year." And, and, we, and we just started believing, it. and we walked into the park and we were gonna win. I mean that was just and if we didn't, all right, we'll get them tomorrow for sure. Yeah, you know, uh, everybody remembers Dwight Gooden. They remember Daryl Strawberry, Lenny Dykster. I mean, all these guys, Ray Knight, that played for you all, you know, in 86. And, you know, Gary Carter, which I was always a big Gary Carter fan myself. But, you know, yeah, me, me thinking too. about that old World Series and, and everything that, you know, it took to get there. And then the World Series, of course, was, a, you know, you took seven games to actually win it. Now, that had to be an amazing journey just to play, you know, the whole World Series end up winning it, but I also read where there's few players that kind of like, eh, maybe we're not going to win it in the seventh game. It was kind of like already given up. You want me to tell you the truth? <laughs> <laughs> well, go think, ahead. Well, well, David, I think you're actually referring to game six of the World Series. Oh, the six. Uh, okay, but I will back back you up because Houston, I mean, that was that postseason was one of the most memorable in baseball history. It has been voted top five all time, like by ESPN and all those people that do all those things. But, uh, you know, you think the the the, uh, the Red Sox, they had a big, huge battle against the Angels. Donnie Moore gave up a home run later, a couple years later, committed suicide because of it. I mean, Boston almost didn't make the World Series. And then you look at us playing the Astros, uh, we were down to where if we played, if we didn't beat them in game uh, hello, five or six, but well, we went 16 innings, and the worst part was, and what was important about that was, if we had had to come back and play, we would face Mike Scott. Yes, in New York, Mike Scott was cheating big time. He was in the in our guy's mind. Besides physically, he had a he had a scuff ball he was working, and I I was the one who found the scuff balls uh, uh, in New York on the the second game he pitched against us. But if if, if we had lost that game to the Astros, that 16 game, you know, we wouldn't have been in the World Series neither. But we got to the World Series. We were down 2-0 at home. We go to Boston. And um, had David Johnson pulled a good one. Um, him and Mex, uh, Keith Hernandez, one of our captains, got together and said, hey, Skipper, what do you think about us just not even going to the ballpark today on travel day? Where you normally go in and you know, well, it's another league. You don't play on that field, and you take bang practice and, and all the media stuff that goes on. Yeah, we were the Mets, dude. We didn't go to the park, and it made some people mad. Yeah. So, but but we got out of there. We got we we took two out of three, so we're down. We we come home from final two games, but we're we're down three to two. One more win, it's over. And what you're talking about was game was game six was, um, you know, we were down to two strikes, two outs on four hitters. One strike's all they needed. The champagne was on ice in, in the visiting locker room, which, you know, once we came back, I, I'm not, it's not a spoiler anymore. It's been 30-some years. But when we came back, 
Dave had a heck of a time getting all that champagne and ice and all that down before that team came in. You know, that would have been a mess if they came in with all that champagne after just losing that bad one when, you know, we had uh, a hit here, a hit here, and then and, 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 uh, uh, they brought in um, you know, my buddy Sheraldi, Calvin Sheraldi was their closer. And uh, then they brought in Stanley, there's a wild pitch, ties the game. And then Mookie Wilson battling like eight, nine, ten pitches. Gets that ground ball toward Buckner, rolls between his legs. And, um, you know, at that point, uh, you're right. Back to your original question, that was a long way to get to the fact that you wanted to know, did any of the guys on our team think we were, you know, we were in trouble? I, I read yeah, it. Yeah, there was, there was three or four guys in the clubhouse watching uh, two in the manager's office. Uh, one guy was undressed trying to get a flight home yet that night. And, you know, um, you know, I do a lot of speaking around the country to corporations and associations. And, uh, and, and today in our world, uh, I talk a lot about character. And one of the things that I tell people is, you know what? Um, we had a lot of char- characters on that team. And we had a whole lot of talent, but it wasn't necessarily like I had been leading up to here. It wasn't a lot of character necessarily. Because you don't quit on your, you don't quit ever, especially mm-hmm. in the World Series. I mean, I mean, I thought maybe, you know, it was over for us. I ain't gonna lie. Mm-hmm. But I didn't go in the clubhouse. You know, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, as I look at that organization, they haven't won since. Well, that's because they traded me away the next spring, right? I know yeah. you're going to ask me that. I know you want to say it, yeah, David we're, Cone. That's we're right. Gonna, <laughs> yep, we're going to get we're going to get in that too here in a minute. Now, Davey Johnson, what kind of a manager was he? What did you think about Davey? Davey was Davey was a solid manager. I mean, you know, um, uh, he had we had so much talent uh, that I, I think Mickey Mouse could have could have managed us, uh, but. You know, uh, he 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 had his he had his guys he talked to, uh, but you know I've always said that managers in baseball and probably coaches in a lot of sports, head coaches particularly, um, I think only about twenty percent make a positive difference. You know, make winners out of losers. Twenty uh, percent, yep. Uh, another twenty percent hurt their team, and the other balance 40 50 percent 60 percent it don't make no difference yeah i mean you know you say oh you're a great coach <laughs> yeah but a smart coach would say no you look at my players i got good players <laughs> i was also reading up a little bit on about uh, a little bit about a video that i guess you were made you a star i don't know i didn't watch the video i don't know if you were break dancing or what but the let's go mets video could you tell us a little bit about that is kind of crazy. I, I I actually have a picture someone gave me. It was of me and another guy, Rick Aguilera. That we're sitting in the clubhouse. We were being pitched this idea of us making a a music video, and and the look on Rick Rick Aguilera's face and mine were like, what? You know, and everybody in there was like, what? I mean, we're the Mets, dude. We don't mess around with that kind of Mickey Mouse thing. Well, we ended up. Uh, they, they told us each we were each getting a VCR machine if we do it in 200 bucks. And so everybody kind of said, okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, they had this song, Let's Go Mets, Let's Go Mets. And, you know, uh, I ended up being in the thing quite a bit. Uh, when they did the team picture, I was sitting right in the middle of them and I was had, had a bat turned upside down. I was pretending like I was playing guitar, you know. <laughs> and so uh, they also shot me doing the, I was I used to juggle a little bit and I was juggling two baseballs and an apple. And every time the apple would come around, I'd throw them in my mouth and I'd take a chunk of it and just keep going. And uh, I think they got a shot of me one day. He was alive actually during a game off some footage where um, it was probably like right after we got them fighting another team. But I had found a boxing club, the clubhouse. So I'm, I'm out there on the top of the bench going, you know, with this big old huge boxing glove on. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I got some, I got some airtime for being you know backup catcher. I, uh, I don't know. They thought I was whatever. Yeah, no, you know, been a backup catcher. Uh, now Gary Carter. Now he used to come over here at Flemingburg. 
uh, Woody Fryman lived over here and Woody and oh, yeah. Gary played together. And, and I know I just talked to Woody's son, Jeff yesterday while I was at Walmart. So, you know, Woody's from, you know, a few miles away from here. And I know Gary used to come down here and they used to hunt or hang out together over there in Flemingsburg. But, uh, what kind of person was Gary Carter? You played with him there. Yeah. Um, well, to start off, it's easy to tell you what I think, what I thought of him. We have we have one child. His name is Cody Carter Hearn. Mm. So that's that's for starters. But yeah. he was a man. He was a family man. He was a man of faith, and he was a good guy, and he could play. Uh, now, no nobody's perfect, you know. And, and a lot of players didn't like him. They called him camera kid and things of that nature because he was, you know, he was a little bit too willing to get you know yeah. in, be interviewed or whatever and uh i i saw a little bit of that part of him uh after later on uh after playing with him that year uh but you know uh you tell me my son's gonna grow up and be like gary carter and i'll say great exactly and i always loved watching gary i thought he was a heck of a catcher a heck of a hitter so uh yeah. you know you know i'll never forget gary carter but uh you know, everybody kind of remembers their first home run. Now, do you remember your first home run and who it was against? Yeah, that was that was. This is probably one of my one of my favorite memories um, that stands out in my career uh, as well. Um, it was uh, Father's Day, and my folks had flown up from New York to be there for Father's Day weekend. And of course, usually Sunday day after night game, I would be tied to get to catch. And uh, we were playing the Pirates, and uh, uh, I was facing one of the relievers, Cecilio Guante. And he was a big, he was about 6'5", and he threw sidearm and threw really hard. Uh, and we had faced each other a lot in the minor league. So, uh, but I, I think there was runners on first and second or something, and he hung a slider up chest high, and I knocked it out of there. And, uh, you, you know, on my introduction video for I speaking, it, uh, you know, run around the bases and, uh, you know, hit home plate and went in. And in that year, uh, the Mets fans were, were maybe as crazy as we were. Uh, and they insisted on players when you hit a home run at home to, to come upstairs and do, do a curtain call. Well, I was just raised to be humble. Don't show anybody up. You do your job. Let your bat do your talking for you. And it just didn't even occur to me. Well, they're going, and players are going, hey, get the curtain call. Let's go. We got to get the damn game off. And, and as it turned out, the, um, the, 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 the cover picture to the book that I did, uh, that is actually me coming up on top of the dugout steps. Of course, background's all cropped. Um, but Keith Hernandez and Gary Carter literally pushed me up the four steps. Uh-huh. And when I got to the top, I'm like, and, and I did that, put my hand up, and it, guess I had one finger up, like one, I don't know what I was signaling, you know, because <laughs> that was just not my style, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, but they pushed me up there. And then, and then the last, the next and last cool thing, in my opinion, about that is um, the grounds crew guys, uh, must have, they took some, you know, some bats, some signed bats or something from a couple of guys, and they retrieved the home run ball. They traded some, you know, somebody, uh, one of the fan who caught her got it, and they went out and found the ball. So after the game, they gave it to me, and then after I showered and we left, I met my folks outside the locker room. I was able to give that that ball to my dad on Father's Day. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, because my dad and mom were very you know, uh, they they were real parents, and uh, my dad, uh, you know, without without either both of their their playing role that we're supposed to play as parents, I would have never had a chance to play, do some of the things I got to do. Exactly, and uh, you know, after the World Series, I know a lot of teams back then still do if they go, would go to the White House. Now, you went up there when Ronald Reagan was president. I mean, besides being a great feeling being at the White House. How was it like being there with Ronald Reagan? Because he was my favorite president. Well, uh, he, he he is one of my favorite too. Uh, but you know, I don't I don't think maybe in the moment we we know the greatness. 
you know, it, it takes a while for it to settle in and, and you look back at history and then you go, wow, that guy was a hell of a president. And, uh, but he was a former movie star and it yeah. was, it, he was just different. And of course, George Bush, another president was his VP. And, and so it was, um, uh, it was a rare, it was a big honor. And I find, I find it, uh, I find it aggravating that some people and teams, because of politics and stuff, refuse to go to the White House. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I was going to say I could go with that too, but uh, we better stay away from that because we're probably yeah. offending too many people. But, uh, yeah. but uh, yeah. let's talk about something that kind of maybe offends you the trade. Ah, uh, the trade. Yeah, so so the following well, on the off season after eighty six, there was rumors going around, you know, for different there was like two or three clubs that were interested in, in trading for me. And one of them happened to be the Kansas City Royals. Uh, now my wife was she just told was reminding me again that she tells a story like one of them was the San Diego Padres. <laughs> you know, well she's from the South Shore of Long Island, was a beach girl and, and I'm from the east coast of Florida and I was raised on the water. And she was like, she was pulling for the Padres, you know. And then all of a sudden, with five days left in spring training, turned about turned out to be the NC Royals. And, you know, to hear her tell it, you know, we was going to be going out and living in the wheat fields, <laughs> something like that. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I got word with five days left in spring training, got a call from Joe McAvain, the like VP of the Mets, and said, hey, Ed, we, you know, the, there was a trade made down, and, uh, you know, you're, you're heading to Kansas City. And, um, you know, and, uh, when I talked to uh, John Sherholtz, the, the general manager, then later on, um, uh, you know, I was told that, you know, they traded for me to take over, you know, that young pitching staff they had there in 1985. Saber, Hagen, Goobas, all those kids that won, you know, were 21, 22 years old, 1985, won the World Series against the Cardinals. So, you know, part of me, I was kind of divided about the trade because, I thought we had so much talent there with the Mets that, that I might be missing out on, you know, <laughs> some jewelry over the next three or four years. But yeah. then again, the other side of that coin is, you know, I had, had a great rookie year, did a good job for Gary when he was, you know, he got hurt in August, missed a couple weeks, and uh, everybody was, uh, I'll never forget the next day after he got hurt and it was going on the deal for two weeks, the newspaper headlines and all the big New York papers, worst thing that happened to the Mets, Carter goes down. You know, well, uh, at the end of two weeks, we had players in the locker room were busting Gary's shops because we were like 11 and three with, with me catching every day. And the guys, tell, them guys are telling Gary, man, don't you think you need to ice that thumb a few more days, buddy? Oh, <laughs> it did. It did make him real mad. So, you know, that, that, that was part of the reason that I, I was, I got traded over there was because the Royals wanted me. And, uh, and I remember when I was talking to Joe Mack during that phone call, I, I said, by the way, Joe, uh, who'd, you, who'd you guys, you know, what, what, who'd you get for me? Oh, some AAA pitcher. And I'm like, what the heck? Seriously? This is a true story, I swear. Yeah. And it, it turned out to be it was David Cohn who would ultimately go on to have a really nice career. Um, you know, he, 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 I think he won three or four World Series between Toronto and the, the Yankees, et cetera, came back to Kansas City. A couple uh, but, of awards. Uh, but never won in New York or Kansas City. So, um, but, you know, uh, so, I mean, and what happened to me, I blew my shoulder out two weeks in the season. Yeah. And I made a reconstructive surgery battle for, battle for two years and was so close to being back and playing in the big leagues. It just wasn't meant to be. So I'm out of the game. David goes on, does well. And, you know, of course, you know, I say, oh, who was that you was trading for? Just like you did. And I go, well, you know what? Uh, do you remember some guy named Mendoza? <laughs> no, you probably don't, do you? Well, I'd much rather be traded for David Cohn than some guy named Mendoza. Exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. I'm with you but, there. But I will tell you this, uh, David. Um, there were additional reasons that David ended up in that trade because uh, we were different kind of people. And David did some things in his career. That, that, that we were, probably shouldn't talk about here and had to do with uh, some not good things. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, I've been told that the Royals, you know, the Royals were a very Midwest 
type organization, and 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 they knew what they had in David, and but he was a perfect fit for the Mets, though. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was yeah. another part of the reason that they went. But but you know sometimes it does it does baffle me when people go, oh you trade Dave Cole, you worst trade in world history. Well, you know, okay, I'm sorry, I can't control, uh, you know, my health or or what happened, you know, to my shoulder. I'm sorry, God, I really do suck. <laughs> oh my goodness! Now, if, if, they, if they only knew the rest of the story, you know, which yeah. you got Paul Harvey. But have you ever, you know, heard from New York fans after that trade? I mean, did you ever get any negative or positive comments about that trade? Oh, everybody. The Mets, Mets loved me. I mean, the Mets fans were great to me because, uh, you know, I did things for the community. I, I was out there and around. And, um, you know, my first game at Shea, I made two errors. We lost like 16 to 5. Ron Darling was pitching, and uh, I threw away a butt play, and I threw away one to center field on a steal. It was the th- my first game at Shea. And by my third at-bat when I came to bat, you know, but, but we'd rather see Gary Carter play and Sunday afternoon. There's rookies up there. I made two errors in my first home. With it. There was about 3,000 people booing me. <laughs> you know, be like Johnny LeMaster and, yeah. and put boo on the back of his jersey when he went out there to <laughs> play. But, but, you know, that changed, though, because uh, when I went in the locker room, the media is just huge. I mean, there were 20 people around my locker. I'm like, dang, I didn't lose this game. It was, you know, they scored two touchdowns on us, and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> And uh, but I was I was frank with the newspaper people, media, and the television folks, and I said, "Yeah, it was a tough game. Um, you know, uh, I I hope those aren't the last two areas I'm making the big leagues." And I faced faced up to them, and the rest of the year the media respected me and and and, and treated me right. And uh, I remember they used to have banners hanging around Shea, uh, "We love number forty nine and things like that. So you know, it makes you feel good. Exactly. And Mike Long, he's got a good question right here. He says, Ed, can you talk about the toughest to catch from the 86 rotation? Uh, the toughest to catch. We had a tremendous staff. I, oh, oh, that's no problem. Shoot. Yeah, never mind. I'm thinking starting pitchers. Now, the toughest to catch was, was two guys, Doug Sisk. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they were relievers, and Roger McDowell. Both of them guys were right-handers, and both of them had tremendous movement. And, you know, I, you know, catching Dwight Good, you sit there like you're in the rocket chair and catch Dwight Good and throw in. Well, back then they would say 94, 95. On this radar gun today, it'd be like, you know, 100 or 101. But he was easy to catch. You just sit there, you know, occasionally you catch it wrong, and your hands start, you know, swelling up. But, uh <laughs> All those guys, starters were – Sid Fernandez could be a little difficult, but I was Davey, – Davey hooked me up with Sid because Sid did real well what I was catching him, and we did that, you know, through the whole year there. But Doug Sist, you know, if Mike's a Mets fan, he'll remember Doug would come in in a you know, relief situation and we'd be winning by a couple. Well, he'd load the bases up right away with walks, two walks and hit batter, and he was always giving Davey a heart attack. You know, but he'd get out of it because he had that big heavy sinker. And well, when you catch one of them heavy sinkers, it just peels your thumb. So Dougie was a little hard, and Roger had a big sinker too. But now I can talk about. It, but he's a load up a little KY jelly, <laughs> and when, and man, that ball would just dive. I remember the first time I caught him in in uh, Houston. I had an umpire behind me, and that was another story. But uh, to, his nickname was God. Uh, what takes his name anyway? He was. So anyway, Roger Roger threw me a two a two strike uh, spitter. Now I caught him for a couple spring trainings, but this is my first major league game in a real situation with you know we, you know one run lead type thing. Well, he got two strikes on the guy, and he had a great sinker, but one just went boom, just dropped out of the thing, and I somehow caught it. And they went to throw it back to him and, and grabbed the ball right on the on the KY jelly. And it, yeah. it went flying out of my hand to the backstop. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my goodness. Um, but, Jimmy, you know, Likens, Jimmy Likens here in Vanceburg. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He is in Vanceburg here, in Kentucky, my hometown. Said he caught Saberhagen and and Cubiza, Cubiza. And the double A for the Kansas City organization, his name was David Gaunts. 
he was class of 78 at Lewis County High School. Oh. So, yeah. So, he caught he caught Saber Hagen at one point. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Saber Hagen was another guy that was easy to catch. He threw hard, but he had command of four different pitches. You know, by the time I caught him in the big leagues, I don't know what it was like for, for him. Maybe he was a little younger. It was like some of them rookie pitches I was telling you about after he got drafted. But he fine tuned and he could he could hit the corners. He was kind of a little bit more like a Greg Maddox type, but a little bit more pop than that. Had a great change up too. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, thinking about all you know, your career in the major league there, mostly with the Mets, what would you consider your most memorable moment? Well, like I said earlier, you know, having having a home run on Father's Day and having my parents be there, um, you know, my parents, my parents, uh, they 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 didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of heart, and they gave us three their three kids uh, every ounce that they could give us to help us be whatever we chose to be, and to hit a home run on Father's Day, and then and then get the ball and be able to take it out. Uh, and gives dad, it just, it, it kind of brings a little tear to my eye. I mean, that was just, that was a really special moment, you know, but, but you, you, I mean, it's just, that was kind of a personal thing. You know, the World Series, uh, uh, the game that we clinched the Eastern Division against the Cubs at Shea, and the fans just emptied on the field and pulled up sod chunks that were like three by five, four foot long. I mean, I don't know how we played the next day. It it looked like bombs had gone off on that field. It was like mess. Um, you know, you just, I mean, there was 40 some thousand and 30,000 of them were on that field in like two minutes. Yeah. You know, it, it did not happen the next, you know, in the playoffs against the Astros or, well, we, we, didn't, we didn't win that at home. But in the World Series, they had them big old horses out there. And they tried them horses out in the last inning. <laughs> and folks were coming out on the field with the, policemen on them big horses <laughs> and you know when you uh traveled a lot back then you know you went from city to city what a lot, you know, a lot of times what did you do like on your off time i mean did you just stay in the hotel did you go out to the club i mean what did you do as a player uh you know uh, me personally uh I, I wasn't much on going out to clubs and drinking and stuff i just was just you know, I, I, I was just a little different guy. I mean, there was a few of us on the team, Mookie Wilson, Gary Carter, Tim Tuffle. You know, we, we, we weren't big party guys. A lot of guys, well, you know, especially pitchers. Them dudes go out there, they pitch every – starting pitcher, they pitch one every five days, and then they go out and they just drink it like fish for three days to spend one day recovering and then pitch and then start all over again. But, you know, one thing – it is one thing that I, I, I do regret not doing more – on road trips, you know, getting out and seeing, seeing these different cities and stuff. Um, you know, uh, I, I just, um, you know, I, I think David, um, I think I had health issues you know, yeah. that I played through and didn't know I had. So I felt like I just needed my rest as much as possible. And that's just looking back after it's all over and, and, and realizing all that happened to me after I was out game health wise. Uh, so, but I, I just, uh, uh, you know, we, we slept in ball players are terrible about, you know, you don't, you don't get out of the ballpark till, you know, midnight time to get something to eat. And you, then, you know, it's hard to unwind. So you can sleep about two, three o'clock, you sleep till noon, you know, so there's not a lot of day left, you know, time you go to the park at two or three in the afternoon, play little cards, things of that nature. Yeah. Al Oliver told me, he said, he just hung out in the uh, hotel room. He said, he didn't go anywhere, just went to the hotel, went to sleep, got up the next day, went to the ballpark, and that was it. Al was a boring guy just like me. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there you go. Now, uh, you know, last little question here before we talk about after baseball. Now, a lot of people, on, you know, you play for the New York Mets, of course, the 86 World Series champions. Is there any good clubhouse stories you can share with us about that year? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, probably, not R-rated. <laughs> yeah. uh, you mean in Big Lick in both Kansas City and New York, or yeah, you can uh, do, you can do either, whichever you think was a funny. Well, well, uh, well, uh, well, I tell you, you know, I got I was I was fortunate and blessed to play with a man by the name of Bo Jackson in Kansas City, and uh, you you just wouldn't believe David how gifted that man was. 
I mean, he was just like a Greek goddess. He could run like the wind. He was just huge, just massive man. And, and you know, people joke around with him, but you, you don't want to piss him off. Yeah. I, I saw him get mad at a guy on our team, the Royals, and we were taking bag practice inside. And, and he took that guy with one hand and lifted him off the ground, had him pinned on the wall by his neck. Oh, wow. And one hand. It took three of us to get him off of him. But basically, Bo's a great guy. He hunts and fish, and I like Bo. But one day, uh, you know, back then, before all this stuff happens, it was 9-11 and now the COVID thing. Uh, people would, uh, ladies or women or whatever, would cook cookies or cakes or, you know, they'd know it's somebody's birthday and they'd bring a big old cake in. So one day, I remember being there in Kansas City, and uh, this is one of my bow stories. Um, um, I, I went around, I got up to that cake, I was like, oh, I stood back and I said, man, y'all don't eat this cake here. I think it's spoiled. <laughs> I, I, I think it's spoiled. What do you think, Bo? What do you think? Didn't smell that damn thing. He stuck his head no down there, and I took him from behind and hit his body. Put his head and snapped it down in that big old cake. He came up, oh, and then he started running around. Of course, you know, he ain't got no trouble catching this old slow white guy, but uh, <laughs> not too many people have dunked Bo Jackson in the cake uh, <laughs> before and lived to tell about it. <laughs> Exactly. But, uh, no. I'll tell you. I'll tell you another good story about Bo. Bo is such a gifted athlete, and um, uh, I think Buddy Black, one of our pitchers, we had a ping pong table at the clubhouse here in Kansas City for a while. You know, you get tired there after a while. But Bo could play some ping pong. I mean, he, you know, he was an upper level ping pong player. He, not many of us could beat him. So one day, Buddy Black brought this fellow in to the clubhouse, just hanging out with him, a friend. Well. Um, what what Buddy didn't tell, and he, well, he, he told us, some of us, but um, Buddy said to Bo, because Bo was like, y'all can't keep my, I'll bet, I have 100 bucks, any of y'all will take me on, let's go. Well, Buddy said, well, you know, my friend here, he likes sports reporters and stuff, he like, you know, he said he'd take your ass. <laughs> and Bo like, bring it on, show me your old green money, man. <laughs> and and they started volleying. and the guy just played with him for a while. And it turned out this guy was like a professional ping pong player. Oh wow. And he smacked dab put it to Bo. Bo was like, what the <laughs> <laughs> And it was too dang funny, man. It was too funny. Bo 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 got schools. But uh, I guess if you want a New York story, one of my favorites is you know, we played in Houston early in the regular season. Uh four of our guys got in trouble and put in you know, cooters or cooters or someplace, and uh, you know, and, and the Astros hated us, and the whole town hated us, and <laughs> so it was, it was headline and all this. So I was out that night with these guys. I had left like 15 minutes before because I didn't hang out too long, but or I would have been in with these guys, and nothing. They were really set set up, and it was just it was some bad cops. As we're figuring out, there are a couple of them these days. So. These guys get put in jail. Well, a bunch of us went to the ballpark the next day. It was in Houston. But we went to the park like 2 o'clock, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And we took uh, white adhesive tape, athletic tape. We t took uh, black shoe polish. We must have went through six balls of that. And we, we painted them black. And we taped up each, each locker had about four or five of them like jail cells. Like they were jail bars. And we put... Uh, a couple cigarettes, a box of matches, and a piece of soap on their on in front of their locker, and they they kind of have to commit all together. And here's these four lockers like jails cells in there. Oh goodness! You know that's they're that's like, good. Yeah, we they're like we had enough of that last night. Cut this out. <laughs> exactly, which I read a little bit about that. Now, you know, after of course you got traded, and then the shoulder injury put you out of baseball more or less. But then, I mean, it's just like a domino effect. It wasn't, you know, very good after that. You had a shoulder injury. And then tell everybody, if you don't care, what else has happened to you since then? Well, um, so I was out of the game in, in probably 1991 or uh, 1990. And by the fall that next year, I was on dialysis and told I was an in-stage renal failure. Uh, I also told I had a condition called hypogammaglobulinemia, which is the deficiency of the immune system. Uh, and, and that immune system is also helps. It's a big energy provider, this hypogammaglobulinemia, this stuff, 
your body produces. Well, my body didn't produce that. So I've been since 1991 or two, I've been taking an IV treatment once a month, every four weeks for that. I, the hypoglobulin, it's about 10 grand of IV. It's about, uh, I don't know, my wife gives it to me, my wife's a nurse. But um, I was on dialysis there uh, within a year after being out of the game and, and had my first of what's been three kidney transplants. Uh, it, you know, my last one here has been really knock on wood, been uh, 2002. Uh, my first one lasted seven years. My second one did not start. And my third one was uh, 2002. So I've had it 18 years. Knock on wood, baby. But um, also got bad cases of sleep apnea. I take 30, 35 pills, 30 to 40 pills a day. I have been doing that since 1992. And, uh, some of the a lot of side effects from some of these pills to keep you from your body from rejecting kidney transplant they cause lots of other different things and, and different things for different people and uh, one of the things that that, uh, that I, I had trouble with because I grew up on the east coast of Florida and I was out in sunshine all day doing some sport or swimming or snorkeling or fishing uh, I've had 45 skin cancers taken off of me you know cut off of me I've had hundreds of other ones frozen all that stuff but uh one of them went bad here on the side of my head and i had to have 30 range grounds of radiation and uh, now that's got my teeth all messed up and stuff and i don't know what we're gonna do there but uh um it's been a journey i mean uh you know another thing that happened to me there after that first transplant the medications one of the side effects can be mood swings and depression and I spiraled down a year and a half later, and I was, I end up in my basement with a loaded 357. I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep, keep playing this game. And I, you know, I, I can only guess, David, what you, what, what happened to you for being stupid sliding into home plate head first, David. You, I know. Don't, you don't do that to us catchers, man. We'll take you out, baby. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you know, you, I just, I wish I could interview you about how you handle all that. And, you know, I was down in that basement, and mine was kind of medication-induced side effects, uh, but it was real. And, um, you know, I, I just, um, you know, it's been a journey. Uh, and, but I can tell you this, you know, I only got a little less than three years of Major League Baseball time, but I could have played 12, 15 years and never had the opportunity to do some of the things I've been able to do since then. And not because of a World Series or the Major League Baseball, but because of the stuff that's happened to me after that. Yeah. Um, I, I tell people, uh, well, somebody said this to me, and then I, I kind of, I, I thought it was pretty funny. They said, Ed, you've been to the penthouse, to the outhouse, and back. And I said, hey, boy, that's right, you know. And uh, But, you know, I tell people... I, I for 25 years I've had this wonderful opportunity to do uh, keynote speaking at corporate events and associations, some schools and, and other things, but mostly corporate events, some churches and stuff. Yeah. And um, you know, with all the changes happening, it's sort of like since 9/11 it started. Now with all the stuff that's going on in our country today, we go through change and we face life's curves. Title of my book: Conquering Life's Curves. Uh, but I tell people it ain't at, it is not at the penthouse or the, or the World Series of your life. When you grow, when you become the real person you were meant to be. And, yeah, you, know, you went from the penthouse to the outhouse, which you know I heard you say that a few times. Which I was going to ask you about that. It's very mentioned it, but your book now, the book was is it about your story? You know, with the uh, uh, conquering life's curves, is this an? It's an autobiography, right? It's autobiographical, but uh, it's in this. It is autobiographical. It's not baseball. It is some baseball because that was part of my life. But um, what happened was I began to speak, and uh, a couple big time speakers you probably know them, Zig Ziglar, uh, and uh, a couple other guys were having lunch at this big national social speaker association. And, and they didn't know me from Adam. And they finally introduced themselves and they said, "Oh, you the guy played ball." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah." And, yeah. Well, what happened? What happened to you? And I told them a little of that. And they're like, 
but what's the name of your book? You got it written at least one book. And I'm like, nah, I mean, oh, no, ain't nobody. And, you know, this was like 1994, yeah, when I just started speaking. And they said, man, you're crazy. You got to write a book, man. I'm like, oh. But then I got to thinking. Our son was born in 1992, our only, only child. And as bad as my health was, uh, I got to thinking, you know, I mean, I'd be here when he's a, He's 14, 15, 16, 17 years old when when kids need the father most. And so I not only is autobiographical, but there's in there is loaded with life le- lessons. I call them nuggets. Because I wrote that book in large part because I wanted my two year old son to at least have me there on paper to, to help him grow up to be, you know, a, a a strong contributing a member of our society, and I think that's the job that all of us fathers have. But I was so sick there, and for quite a long time, I I, I remember telling my doctor, "I ain't gonna make 50." Are you kidding me? So uh, yeah, I'm 59 now, so I'm nine over par. Uh, I tell him every year when I see him. But uh, you know, uh, uh, the book has was has been uh, really special. I mean, for you know, publisher picked it up, and then, then they, you know, I had a great contract. We were on the Oprah Winfrey show with it, and yeah. then, uh, and then after they, after slowed down selling, I, I, I was able to, the, all rights reverted back to me, and I still take it out speaking there. I have people call me and ask me, you know, can you send this book to my father? Well, like Father's Day, is that today or tomorrow? Oh my gosh, yeah. So I, I no wonder I've been sell, sending a bunch of books out here lately. Cause I just fulfill them here. I got, you know, the envelope and I'll sign on people and, you know, they send me a check or a PayPal or some other thing, Ben, Venmo or something. I don't know. It's not about the money, you know, David, it's about, it's about having the opportunity to have a positive impact on people's lives. Um, You're exactly you right. Know, yeah. You know, it, it's not, I felt, you know, I take all these pills, you know, and I don't know about you, but you, you've been through a lot of things. So tell me if this is accurate. You know, the best medicine I can take is when I have a shot, an opportunity to be in front of an audience and know that I have, I know I've made a difference in somebody's life. Or when I, I mean, I, I get, I've had some, some tremendous feedback on the book at times. Um, I remember one guy told me, he said, man, I took the Bible and I took your book to the hospital. And it was your book that got me through. Uh, I don't know about you. I don't know about you, but that's the best medicine I can take. There ain't no pills that people make. No pharmaceutical people can make any medicine any better than being able to make a difference in people's lives. And and, 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 and like I said, it, it's not at the penthouse of life. It ain't because yeah. of my baseball. It was because of the outhouse. When I went through all that crap, and I still go through crap, but you know what's in an outhouse, right? Yeah, crap. Yeah, fertilizer. Exactly. Fertilizer. Yeah. That's what exactly. I call it. When life goes tough, that's when we have the opportunity. It's either going to shine us up and we're going to grow or we're going to get buried in the weeds. Jimmy Likens was wanting to know, where did you grow up on the east coast of Florida? It says a number of the Lewis County people here are late, located in Titusville, Florida. Oh, okay. Yeah, I grew up south Titusville, about oh, an hour and a half from Fort Pierce, Vero Beach, Florida. Not far from, I was about 15 minutes from where the Dodgers spring training was there at Holman Stadium and, and the Dodger town, that old historic, you know, the great Dodger organization. Yeah, I was about 15 minutes south of there on the East Coast. Okay, yep. so you're a little, you wasn't too far from there then, was you? No, no, just maybe an hour and a half, two hours south. Yeah. So where are some of the places you've been, you know, your motivational speaking skills that you've, you know, been a speaker where are some of the locations that you've been? Because I know you've done several. What are some of the locations that, you know, really stood out to you that you've spoke at? Okay, David. So I've been every, I've been all over the place, man. I just, uh, it's, uh, you know, I've spoken, in, I think I've spoken in every state, spoken in Canada. Uh, I don't, I haven't never traveled overseas or anything, but uh, I mean, I've been in, in, it's crazy. I've been in five star motels in, in New York City for a thousand people. 
And, you know, I might be in a little bunky town in Kentucky with, with 40 people. And, you know, I, I might, that might be a better time just because the right people were there that needed, needed to hear what I had to say that day. You know, I got, I, it's fun. A couple people, you know, I've gotten duplicates of people saying different things about uh, speaking. And I have, I have, uh, I have a computer file folder that, you know, when people email or text or something, if I like a, what they said about, you know, oh, you did this and you made me think about that or blah, blah, blah. I'll put it in there. Or if it's a written letter, uh, I have hard copy folders. And you know what's so good about those? Because you know, too, David, we've been through a lot and we've come a long ways. Mm-hmm. But we still have our days, right? Yes. And for me, one of my tricks is when I get feeling like mopey dopey and have me a pity party, which we do, don't we, David? Even, yes. even though we have, in the world's view, we've come back from a lot of stuff, you and me. But we still have them pity parties. And when that happens, David, and if you ain't doing this, you need to do it. Because I can pull out that folder or I can go on my computer and I can start reading things that people have said. Like things I've already told you. And yeah. that, like one of my favorites is, I didn't want to go to those meetings. Those meetings were mandatory. But, oh, I'm glad I did. I needed to be there. You were talking directly to me. You know, I mean, and and you and for me, I can dig into those folders and start reading that stuff, and it just brings me out. It helps me to realize that there's more to life. Got to have a perspective. Perspective is a big word for me. I don't know about you. I bet it is. But, you know, getting the right perspective, we lose that perspective pretty easily. You know, and, and it's because, you know, our human nature is to think about I, I, me, me, poor yeah. me. Oh, this happened. Oh, well, my, you know, I can't afford what the neighbor, you know, the old pity party, but I can't know, but, you know, and, and you know, I've been speaking and all. And then one of the things so many speakers used to talk about, think outside the box. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Make me throw up. Yeah. Here's what I say, David. It's so much more important to think outside yourself. Yeah. When you can think outside yourself and you can do things for other people, now you're going to get that medicine. You're going to get that juice. You're going to feel like what you and I feel like when we have the opportunity to make a difference. And it don't take much. You know, I've learned, uh, you know, that means it can be the, it can be a pat on the back of the shoulder. You never know what people are going through, especially today. You know, I mean, you you might as well count on people going through stuff right now when you meet them. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We, and 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 I I do I came up with a, a a mantra when I heard this. It's a saying, and you know, when I first started speaking, I was I was making a file of all these special quotes about people saying this that the other thing, and I realized. I think what speakers, speakers, speakers do, or you know, good ones. You do, you come up with your own things, like like think outside the cell, for me. But I ran into this quote, and I tell it's really a mantra from my life, and it's a reminder to me. And I always tell, I always quote people to say, like if I quoted you somewhere, I would say, oh, this is David's quote, it ain't me. But this, I can't find who said this, but. But listen to this. This is really big. And this is what I had to remind myself about. And I think it's a great thing for, you know, you know, maybe maybe something you'll catch on to. But it goes like this. Anyone can count the seeds in one apple. But no one can count the apples in just one seed. It's true. You never know. Yes. The impact you can have. I mean, we may never know till we get, you know, I'm going to heaven out where you're going, but that's where, I, you know, and I might find out in heaven about some stuff that I did. I had no idea, mm-hmm. you know, but the other, it goes the other way too. You can also destroy things plant by planting, planting bad seeds and you, you don't know about it. We don't understand, but we can bring people down and never know about it. 
Yep, cool. you're exactly right. Now, you know, you talk about depression, and I know you went through depression. I went through depression, but there's a few things that got me through depression, and this is something I always do. And you, you know, of course, every day of your life, you could, you know, there's way I tell people there's ten things that you can look at every day. Nine of them might be negative. I pick out the one positive every day, and that's what gets me through every day. It could be the sun's out. It could be that it's summertime. It could be that, you know, the Cincinnati Reds are playing on TV. But I always try to pick out that positive thing every day, and that's what gets me through that day. Now, when you struggle with your depression, and you was talking about being in the basement, what got you through your depression? Great question, David. I wish I could had time and we could, I could ask you the same things about what helps you. Uh, but I will tell you what happened to me. Uh, I don't think that I wanted to go anywhere, but I was thinking about it, not swinging, stop swinging. Now I sign autographs, keep swinging. Yes. Don't quit. Right. That's just another little reminder. I try to leave people, but in that basement, when I said, no, this ain't right. And, and I said, this ain't right because I had a wife that cared for me deeply. I had a faith in my creator and that was not what he wanted me to do. And then I thought about the people that I would be hurting if I just quit. My family, my parents had raised with my brother, my sister. My son would have not been around. But so I was I put that thing down. But then, and this is this is a real key to me, you got to take action. And I made a plan, and long before I walked up the 13 stairs out of that basement that day, I decided three things. I had to get back to the basics of my faith. That was number one, action plan. Number two was, I had, I had, I had heard Zig Ziglar speak just before I had gone on uh, dialysis. I was in Denver with, I was working with the New York Life at the time. Don't ask me why, but. Anyway, I'm not a salesman, but Zig Ziglar said, you, you can change where you're at in life by what you put into your mind. And I got to tell you, David, I was a 3.96 GPA for my class of 600 and some, but I did not read them big old thick books, that Moby Dick stuff and all that. I, the only one I read was The Old Man in the Sea, because it was about this big. Yeah. But you know what I started doing? I started filling my mind by reading and listening to set tapes positive stuff, things that would help me think right. And that was very, very beneficial to helping me get out of get out of where I was at in that basement. And so the faith getting back to basic my faith, uh, putting good stuff into my mind. And the final thing was I had to stop thinking about me. I had to realize that this world was not about Ed Hearn. And those three things, I walked upstairs and I began to put those things into action. And I, I got books. You may see some behind me here. That ain't nothing. I got books in the basement. Just we throw way more books than most people buy in a lifetime. We had a, you know, a, a frozen pipe break over all my books at one point. Like, well, no, geez. But I, I became a reader. I hated reading. And I listened to cassette tapes. And and I'm not going to tell you one person at all. I'm mean, I ain't going to say, you know, it was all Christian stuff. Or I won't say it was Buddha or Anthony Robbins or Zig Ziglar. It was just a combination of putting good things into the mind. Somebody wants to say garbage in, garbage out. Or good stuff in, good stuff out of the old computer. Our brain's the same way. You know, I was pretty lucky when I had my injury with... Uh... Right after I got hurt, Al Oliver came to the hospital to see me. And he just, you know, retired a few years before that. So in 89, he came to the hospital to see me probably a week or two after I got hurt. And, and he left, he, you know, he left, uh, he had a hat there, a Pittsburgh hat, and I still have it. Said, never give up. He left uh, little notes for me all over the place that said, you know, stay positive. And then he had a book there he signed that, yeah, I think it, uh, life is a game, don't strike out. So I had Al there that was always pushing this positivity. Now, yeah. you know, 
things like that will get you through your hard times. It won't solve all your problems, but it's no. good to have somebody there in your corner in the oh, back of your actually. mind. You're thinking, you know, when I have a bad day, you know, Al Oliver came to see me. Yep. And it's, and it's our job because the people came through our life, but we needed them to go out and make a difference in other people's lives because um, we've experienced things and we've learned things. And uh, I'm a great believer in third party influence, especially with our kids. You know, we try to raise up, raise up kids and boy, you know, at a certain age, yeah, I don't care who you are. They ain't gonna listen. Yeah. And, and I learned that, that uh, I tried, have tried, and I always try to be that third party matter for people that, that are, you know, that they're struggling with their kids or whatever. I say, all right, well, you hook them up with me. Let's just give me, give me a couple times together with them. I'll just hang out because they're gonna listen to me much more than they're gonna listen to you folks. Or, and my, my kid, he don't want to listen to me. I'm dad. D A D. That. Vicious word. It's worse than a four-letter word. Yeah, <laughs> that three-letter word, dad, mom. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And you also have a foundation. It's called Bottom of the Nine. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. It's um, you know, I started in 1999. We found went through the 501c3 process, just like you guys have, and um, it's just a vehicle. Uh, the name, the Bottom of the Ninth, uh, was easy because uh, I have felt for a long time that our country was was heading in the wrong direction, slowly. Um, and I've heard people say, oh, we're on a slippery slope, or we're on the cliff, we're about to go over the top. And I said, man, let's call it what it is. This, this, this country is baseball, right? Well, I'm struggling to say that today, unfortunately. But I say, man, it's the bottom of the ninth in America. We got to make a character comeback. So our 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 five one c three nonprofit, the Bob and Ninth, where character counts, is is about trying to help this country make a character comeback. And we have four project focus areas. It's kind of designed like a baseball field. First base is youth with character. So we do things. Uh, most of us with speaking or uh, providing uh, inspirational or positive stuff for organizations that can't afford. You know, have Ed Hearn come in and speak. So, you know, we make, we, we provide things like that. So first base is youth with character. Anything to do with youth. Second base is the character to conquer. And that's for chronically ill, terminally ill patients, their families, and those who care for them. And, you know, uh, man, I don't know. <laughs> You've been through it too, but you know, when people are struggling with their health, that is a great time. That's that's in the outhouse, and that's a great time to step in, and, and they're they're going to be more receptive, you know, to you helping them out. Third base is the character of the great outdoors, which just stemmed from a love of the outdoors, hunting, fishing, being outdoors. My son and I, before he got cancer, we were out there. We just and and we enjoy taking veterans, uh, disabled folks. Uh, moms and kids. One thing, though, ain't, ain't no digital coming with us. Yeah, you know. And sometimes it's just like maybe it's just six hours out going, going, going fishing somewhere or whatever. But you know, I find it's funny. Sometimes I'll take dad and mom and with kids, and and then we'll be riding back, and they'll be like, Oh, oh, where's my phone? Oh, I didn't bring it. That's right, you didn't let us bring it. Man, you know, I I had. I have been without my phone for, for four hours now. It's amazing, <laughs> you know. And I never thought about it because I was out there and you know out in the wo- out in the woods, and it was just so relaxing. And I'm like, okay, you've learned. That's what the character of the great outdoors is about. <laughs> and then home plate is our fourth project area, and that's just basically the character of faith. And that that is that's around you know opportunities. To, I speak at churches and, and uh, you know. Faith-based type of opportunities to, you know, character characters is, is a a fake word for living right. There's an old book; it's been best-selling book for thousands of years. Yeah, you know, and and people get freaked out. 
about it, but it's all about, it's really about character and good people, you know, all, and people that have struggled and all that. Well, just the character of faith. Exactly. And I know, uh, you know, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you about uh, your motivational speaking or if they want to get a hold of you about your book or if they want to get a hold of you about your foundation, where do they go for all that? You know, I'm all over the darn internet. Right now, my speaking uh, website is down. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm easy to find, and you can find my address. Uh, my email is edhearn49 at awell.com or, or, or ed at edhearn.com. That's easy. Uh, you can find that on the internet just by Googling Ed Hearn, read a few things. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I offer my book up for a $20 donation to the bottom of the night and you just, uh, you can do a PayPal or send me a check, whatever, and I'll, I'll, send, I'll sign it to whoever you want. Um, uh, I get people, I in 10 or 15 of them at a time and, uh, you know, that 20 bucks covers shipping and everything, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're just trying to make a difference and, uh, uh, the bottom of the night that, and, you know, it, it, if you if there are folks out there that can't agree with me in the last three or four weeks or months that it's not the bottom of the ninth in America, I don't know what you've been looking at lately. Exactly. It's, but but it, would, but but it's the bottom night, and and it's going to be over for this country as we have known it if we don't step up the plate. Yeah, so. you're exactly right. And we're going to have to step up to the plate because that snowball rolling down that hill only gets bigger unless you stop it. Absolutely. We've and got Tommy too. Posey here. He's a Chicago Cub scout. He says, David and Ed, great words of wisdom and encouragement for all people. Thanks for being positive and helping people in our daily lives. God bless and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks from Maysville and go Cubs. Thanks, sir. Yeah, I appreciate it. And you know, um, and, and for you folks listen, hey, uh, make sure you, you, you share share uh, David's foundation. Share, go to Ed Hearn on Facebook. Share my story because, you know, we all have a story, but we're, we're all, you know, I, I've been gifted with the ability to share a story, tell a story. And, you know, I think the story is the greatest tool we have for making a difference. You know, the story could... Cause so we all run around with a little bit of this false bravado, this this armor about like, oh, you can't see the real me, right? Well, the story, if you tell the personal story, the story can pierce through that ruggedness and that army, open the heart up, and that's where we can plant seeds and we can fertilize seeds. We can water seeds that are already there. You know, people say, oh, you changed my life. I ain't changed none of your life, man. Only one person can change in your life, and that's the guy upstairs that created us. Yeah, I can help war. I can plant seeds, war seeds, fertilize seeds, but I can't change it. That's up to you and God. Yep, you're exactly right. And if you notice, the foundation is the David Irie Foundation, and of course it's DFDIF. And I always tell people it's make a diff because we're trying to make a difference. So that's the little DIF thing, and. Uh, you know, it, it's been a struggle, and of course, you know as much as I do about struggling and trying to get through life, and, and yeah. you know, it's never easy. Our story, I've had people come up to me and say, uh, you know, just thinking about you and what you're going through has got me through this situation, and to me, that means more to me than anything, and, you know, when I first got hurt, I would always ask, like you said, why me? Why did this happen to me? But then after a while... You know, you kind of realize, oh, I know why me. So that kind of changes your perspective of feeling sorry for yourself or thinking, you know, this God is here. Why did God let this happen to me? But then after a while, you get, you know, understanding your situation, understanding that you can still drive to your destiny, maybe a different destiny, destiny, maybe a different trail, a different path, but you still have you know, your life and you still make a difference in this life and you know why it was you that it happened to and you've got to make the best out of that no matter what the situation. David, you're so right, man. And, you know, it's been a, it's really been, 
a pleasure. I mean, we I don't know how long we've been talking, Albo, but but I think you and I can sit here and talk forever. And and I think people could probably listen forever <laughs> because of, of where we both have been and, and the perspectives that we have. And so I just want to thank you for having me. Maybe we can do this again sometime because I think there's even much more we can talk about. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I can, I, I'll never run out of stories, but I also like to, like to let people know something uh, that hopefully will help them. And uh, so today, brother, I want to tell you, uh, happy birthday. And I know you feel blessed that you having a birthday today. Some yes. people have birthdays and they don't understand how, how wonderful it is. Right, man. I mean, yeah. It could have turned out a lot differently, and and that's for all of us. So uh, today it's been my honor to be on your show and just be a small part of the wonderful work you're doing. And uh, as I tell people when I sign a book, keep swinging, David. Exactly, and thanks for coming on today, Ed. I appreciate it, and we will stay in touch. Yes, sir. You take care, brother. You too.